and welcome to Puck Junk Podcast number 11. Long overdue, but uh, we are back on the interwebs with our conversation about hockey, hockey cards, and all hockey-related stuff. Tim, how you doing? I am fantastic. Why is that? Oh, I don't know. Um, just the sun shining, the birds are saying, oh wait, no, it's nighttime. Um, oh, maybe the Penguins won the Stanley Cup. Did they? I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really keep track after the first round. Well, what? Ha- tell tell us what happened for for those who 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 stopped caring after the Blackhawks were eliminated. Oh, so you're talking about all the fair weather fans that are out there? Okay. Um. Well, see, there was this team from Pittsburgh, and it was stacked full of superstars, and they won the Stanley Cup. The end. Hmm. I uh, was it a close series? Uh, it could have been a lot closer, but um. You know, here's the thing. I give I give credit to the Sharks. They were a great team. If any if any team was out there that the Penguins were going to have a decent series with, the Sharks were probably it. The problem is they were just outmatched. You know, the Sharks had a team that was set up to be a bunch of big thug bullies, and that would have worked fine if they had a team that they were playing that was a normal speed team. But everybody says it time and time and again: speed kills. That's what the Penguins have. They built this team for speed, and that's what destroyed every team they played in the playoffs was their speed. Yeah, all, all kidding aside, I watched every round of the playoffs. I watched almost all of the finals games, and I even, uh, I mean, of course I watched the, the sixth game, and uh, I was uh, I, I was kind of hoping for a seven-game series, and even though like most of the games are settled by one goal or maybe two goals, it just didn't feel that close for the Sharks. Like, if they won, it's like they barely won. And if the Penguins won, they convincingly won. Even though it, it might have been like a 3-2 to two score, it, it felt like they really had control of the series. And, and I guess that's okay. I mean, it's kind of nice to see a team win and it not be a seven-game thing where the teams are so evenly matched that, like, some fluke overtime goal ends it, right? Well... For my for my own sake and my my health, I was glad it didn't have to go to a seven game because I hate game sevens, especially when my team is playing in them. But you know, you, you're, you're right. It did seem almost like the Sharks were were kind of outmatched at times, and you know they didn't really have an answer for for many of the lines because if you looked at how the Penguins played throughout that entire series, all, all four lines that they were playing had firepower all four of them and you know the they were back checking all the time they were the offense was playing defense i mean everybody says you know murray this and murray that and he stood on his head and he was a great goaltender i don't i don't doubt or or take away from did as as a goalie being a rookie coming in and, and leading your team to the stanley cup championship you can't knock that at all. But just as a little asterisk to put on there, look at how many shots on goal he faced. I mean, pucks weren't getting through to the net. They were getting blocked. They were getting knocked down. They were missing the net. So, I mean, as good as he played, he also could have faced a lot more shots on goal if mm-hmm. you know, the Sharks were able to to do you know, what they had done to their previous opponents. So. You know, it's it's just one of those things. You know, that's why you play the game on paper. You know, everybody touted the Penguins going into the playoffs, and then they thought, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe maybe there's a lot more teams out there that are, are going to wipe them out. They end up going to the finals. I mean, if you listen to any of the sports writers or, or announcers or anybody, they had the Penguins dead in the water. Mm-hmm. Or on the is oh, a better better phrase dead on the ice going into that round against the Sharks, and lo and behold, it took six games, and they were able to get rid of them. Yeah, and <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me, and they did. Uh, they did a they did a good job of that. I was actually surprised that Kessel got edged out for the uh, MVP award. Um, I you know, that is one thing that I agree wholeheartedly with, because when they announced Crosby um, as, the, as the MVP of the finals, I kind of sat there for a second, and I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, are you seriously kidding me? I understand it. 
he got it because of who he is. Yes. And and, and he did, let's put it this way, Crosby not on the team, Penguins don't win cup. I mean, that's that's just the way they're the way it is. However, from a from a MVP type standpoint, Kessel should have had that. There's no way anybody gets that but Kessel. And I I, don't, I just don't understand that. I, I to this day I don't understand it. Because he's Phil Kessel and not Sidney Crosby. But see, I think the stigma of Phil way now because you know everybody. You know, there's all the all the inside jokes about Kessel and everything else. He's he's not a leader. He's a crybaby. This, that, and the other. You know what? I think he proved that none of that is true. Mm-hmm. He's just playing the wrong market his entire career. I mean, that that's really the guy's a great hockey player. I mean, you can't you can't take that away from him. It's just he's been in so many unfortunate circumstances. I mean, come on, who can play in Toronto, really? Yeah, it's a tough. It's a tough crowd. It's a tough market. It's a tough audience. Uh, it's a tough coach. It's a tough GM. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't. I don't think I'd want to be there. You're under the microscope constantly up there. Toronto media is deadly. I mean, they could destroy you in an instant. Mm-hmm. So you know, coming to Pittsburgh and have, having to not have to be that guy. Not have to be the number one star on the team. Mm-hmm. Not having to be the number one goal scorer on the team. Not having to be, you know, the guy that carries the team on his shoulder. He blossomed. And that was all it took. Mm-hmm. Take the pressure away from him where, you know, just go out there, be a role guy, play on a second line or play on a third line, and do what you can. Mm-hmm. It, and he did. I mean, granted, the first half of the season, he was – little underwhelming, but the second half, once they got their new coach, he, he, he couldn't be touched. Yeah, that was definitely the, the turning point. Um, so anyway, uh, kind of looking back, twice, so... Twice, by the way. Twice what? It's twice that the Penguins changed their coach mid-season and won a Stanley Cup. Right, and, uh, and let's see, they also, they won their first Stanley Cup uh, 25 years ago. Ninety nine, actually. Yeah, 90-91. You know where I'm going with this. Yes. Yeah, so I want to... I want Great segue. Yeah, well, I want to talk about a... Uh, well, I enjoyed the ninety ninety one season, other than the Blackhawks, you know, getting trounced in the first round by the Minnesota North Stars after winning the President's Trophy, um, only to see the Penguins beat the North Stars and watching that series and saying... Should have been the Blackhawks and the Penguins, but you know, um, a lot of um, a, a lot of great hockey cards came out that year. I mean, I've been waxing nostalgic, kind of on and off all season about ninety ninety one and how a lot of sets came out that year, where it went from just Tops and Opeachy and Panini, if you count those stickers, and I guess the Opeachy stickers too, if you could find them, to like a whole mess of sets. And so, what we want to talk about today is um, what I think we agree is the best set from 1991, uh, which was the 1991 um, Upper Deck Hockey set. Uh, Tim, what do you remember about buying those cards back in the day? Because I know a lot of the people that listen to this, all 25 of them or whatever, maybe I'm padding the stats, but, uh, you know, are, are old enough to remember buying these cards back then. Some of them aren't, but what do you remember about that whole experience? Foil. Foil is what I remember. This is one of the first packs of cards that you ever could buy that the, the pack was actually kind of foily rather than, you know, wax paper, like the normal wax wrappers. Right. Um, you know, and the cards themselves inside were the higher quality type printed cards that you didn't see in any other brand. They weren't cardboard. They were something else. Were they, was it poster board? What was this? This was a new thing, um, especially for kids, because you'd open a pack of these cards and you see, you know, these these great action shot photos and this little in the back where you can almost see a reflection. That was new. That was different. That was groundbreaking for Upper Deck. And, you know, the fact that the year before they came out with, you know, their baseball set, it was only it was only natural for them to transition into the rest of the sports, and that hockey set was. That was 
that was like you said it was one of the, one of if not the best set from 1990-91 well i mean i don't think any of the other sets could could be better for m- many of the reasons and i think i mean one way that kind of doesn't really prove that it's the best set but i think one indicator you go to the store you buy one of those packs or those boxes that say like 100 hockey cards for $5 or 400 hockey cards for $10 plus four unopened packs or whatever, right? And when you open that, it's going to be, half of it's going to be at least stuff from like 9091. And of that half, like at least half of that is going to be like Bowman and Score or Pro Set. And mostly Bowman, but not you, if, if you get like, I think I bought one of those packs that had like a hundred cards just on a whim, just to see what I'd get. And it was a lot of Bowman and it might've had one upper deck card and it probably had 30 Bowman cards. So, and it might've had a pro set and it might've had like a junior card and it might've had some stuff from the later nineties and it might've had like some stuff from even a few years ago. So it was like a mix of cards, but like you never see Like, in those, like, bulk lots, you almost never see upper deck cards. Now, I'm not saying that they can't be had for cheap. I just did a quick look on eBay, and, like, the set sells for, like, 10 bucks. The update set for 2 to $10. I mean, you're going to pay more to ship it than to than to purchase the actual set. So, it hasn't necessarily appreciated in value. It isn't like people are necessarily hoarding these, but... Or not anymore, anyway. But uh, you know, they're 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 not like in the junk mixes that you find. No, well, not really. But you know, again, this here's here's another set, albeit a good one, but stuck in that era where everything was overproduced. So there's a lot of it out there. I mean, you go to shows. I mean, you go to a lot of the same shows that I do, and you see table upon table with unopened boxes of this stuff for. 15 bucks or less right. for a wax box. Right. And, you know, the fact that back then they were double that, at least, or more. Well, they were about a buck a pack. I think they were uh, 99 cents a pack. There were 36 packs in a box. So you would probably you could probably get a box for about 30 bucks if you bought it from a dealer. If you bought it at like the drugstore like I did, then you're going to pay a dollar a pack no matter what. But, yeah, they were, they were 99 cents a pack. Which was funny because at the time that was double all the other sets, which were fifty cents a pack, and I think OPT was probably could have been forty five cents a pack. But if you bought them in the U.S., they could have put any price tag they wanted on them. But um, yeah, they were they were double, and yet it, nobody seemed to mind. Like nobody was like, "Oh man, I'm spending twice as much and only getting half as many cards or whatever." Nobody had that uh, complaint. I sure, I sure didn't. I, I was, I, I, you know, if, I guess if I could have done one thing differently, and I, I did buy a lot of cards back then, probably bought the more pro set than anything, but I probably wish I bought a little, probably w- spent more of my money on Upper Deck, because, well, I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's all kind of not really valuable now, but it, I'd rather have like a thousand extras from Upper Deck than like a thousand extras or two thousand extras from Pro Set, if that makes sense. Well, I've got about four thousand extras, so you can have a thousand of them if you'd like. Only if they help me complete sets. Uh, otherwise, you know, <laughs> if they're all of Jason Herder, I'm not interested. Um, no, no, no. They're mostly of uh, like SOT can in holding up the cup and. Steve That's... Weeks looking like he's trying to make some kind of butterfly in the sky pictures. At least he's not sitting on the bench. You know, that was another thing. Like, uh, it's funny that you, you mentioned that Steve Weeks card because his his 9091 Opeachy card, he's sitting on the bench. He's got a towel around his neck. His 8990 Opeachy card, he's sitting on the bench. He's got a towel around his neck. It almost looks like the same photo. It's not, but... It, 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 there's no creativity there. And here, um, I mean, you talked about the paper quality, and yeah, they, they actually would import, Upper Deck was, at least for their 89 baseball set, they imported that paper from Italy. It was like a high-quality paper um, that uh, that they wanted to print the cards on. 
Um, they used a unique color separation process for the printing of the cards. Um, that's how the, the photos had such bright uh, colors. I mean, if you look at like a Blackhawk card from one of the other sets, like Tops, it, the red is very dark. And if you look at it, or, or think of like Theron Flurry, his card where he's like jumping midair and like checking a player, th that red just pops out at you. I mean, they, they, they did the colors really well. The paper was done really well. But then the photographs were also exciting. It wasn't just a guy sitting on the bench. I don't think there's one picture of a guy sitting on the bench. I, I could be wrong. Um, maybe he's sitting on the bench on the back of the card, but on the front yeah. of the card, players are all standing on the ice right. or skating. I was going to say the secondary picture that was on the back, I think there might be a couple with guys on the bench, but you know, this upper deck set, this was the first picture on a hockey card I think I've ever seen of a goalie taking out another player. I don't know if you remember that picture, but Rick Tabarachi's card. Yes, I do remember that. Where, and I don't even know who the player is. It's somebody from the Blues, but you know he's basically wiping the guy just completely off his feet. He's like jumping into him or something, right? Yeah, I thought that card, that was like one of my favorite cards, like picture-wise, from, from what you saw in there. Yeah, well, my favorite will always be the Mario Goslin card, where it's it's shot from like the second level of uh, Great Western Forum, looking straight down on the ice at him, and like the puck is just like I should have pulled it out of the binder so I could look at it, but like the puck is just like teetering like on his stick, and then on the back of the card it's also overhead, and like he ha he's like stretched out like making a stick save. I mean, it's just like. The most ridiculous card, like if you think back to, yep, that's it, that's the one, right? And look at look at where the puck is. It's like right on his leg, and his leg is like right across the front of the goal line, so it's about to fall. And then on the back, yes, thank you, good good timing. Um, yeah, and there it is. Like he's just he's stretched out trying to trying to stop it. I mean, it's such thank you. It's such a cool that that is still like probably that my was not planned at all by the way. Well, no, I don't think. It was completely spontaneous. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, as soon as you said his name, I was like, there it is, right there. Oh, here I found it. Yeah, I mean, I'm just paging through my book. I, I put these... This was one of those sets that I put into... Um, I put in pages right away. Like, well, as I was building it, I put it in pages. And actually, back then, I used to um, use... Uh, BCW brand used to use... Um, Remember those old vinyl pages that stank to high heaven? The 92s? Yeah, something like that, yep. before they went to the Pro 90s. So, yep. if I give my card a little sniff here, I can still smell the vinyl on them from 25 years ago. Like, that that odor, like, the cards still have that odor. Like, there was a lot of, um, and I don't want to get it off into this tangent, but, you know, there was a lot of concern about... Uh, the effect that the vinyl pages were going to have on the cards because um, at the time, vinyl was the industry standard for coin collecting. I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of the dealers that were coin dealers ended up getting into card dealing. That's why there's similar terms like mint, near mint, stuff like that. That's why you can find like the, the, the pocket pages for money and you can find the pocket pages for the trading cards. There was overlap there in, in, in the industries. So what happened by around like 90 or so was that the long-term effects of the vinyl pages on money was finally being seen and it was having a negative effect especially on the metal coins so then everybody was like oh no this is going to damage our baseball cards and we put all our baseball cards and our hockey cards in these vinyl pages and it's going to ruin them so you know sort by like 91 i was converting all my sets from the vinyl pages to the uh to the ultra pro pages because they were the first to not use the vinyl and uh but it's funny because even 25 years later I give this card a whiff it still has that that vinyl smell for what it's worth what's that i think i have tons of those bcw pages still in books and they're probably all stuck together the pages stick together and you know the cards might stick to the pages a little bit but i haven't seen any long-term negative effects i mean i've picked up I've bought sets um, 
that were obviously put in those pages back in like the early 90s because like I might buy a set off of somebody and it's in those vinyl pages and it's in like a BCW binder and you know, I'll say like wow those things really stink but you know it, it hasn't really affected the card in any negative way yeah. um, but uh, anyways getting back to 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 these cards themselves yeah the 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 probably the only rub on these cards if there was one was that they didn't have all the stats but that's okay because they put a picture on the back and that I think that made up for it like they had a creative reason for not uh, listing all the stats um, and the set was kind of small and I think maybe Upper Deck took a conservative approach like whereas I mean their first set was 400 cards and then the update set was 150 cards and you had like I guess all the sets were kind of around there um, anyway but they didn't really like say all right we're gonna do 600 cards and 200 update cards or whatever right they, they they kind of just did what the other companies did but then their update set was kind of small compared to like say well pro set but pro set was over the top um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess if the set was bigger, there would just be more cards of lesser players, and then maybe that would dilute it a little bit. I don't know. Well, that's exactly it. You end up with even more no-name guys or... Referees, coaches. Oh, there's something. The pro set did. Weren't there referee card, cards in Upper Deck? No. Uh, that was also in pro set, but see, imagine if there was a 9091 pro set, if there was like a referee subset in pro set, because all the, or excuse me, in upper deck, because in pro set, there's a ref set, and the refs are mainly, or excuse me, uh, I keep saying refs and coaches interchangeably, there's a set of coaches in pro set, and it's usually the coaches standing behind the bench, the only exception is Tom Watt, who was um, hired pretty close to the deadline, so, or, where, you know, the other Maple Beliefs coach was fired. Tom Watt was hired. It's just a quick, like, hasty headshot that the team probably provided. The rest of them, it's like Pat Burns standing behind the bench, or um, Roger Nielsen standing behind the bench, or uh, Bob McCammon, or, or Bob Johnson, or whoever. And what would have been cool, like, man, an upper deck card of, like, Pat Burns just losing it, right? Because he would lose it, right? That would be the upper deck card, would be Pat Burns with his fist in the air, like, just, ah! Like, just... Right? That would have been, that would have been, um, that would have been the upper deck card. That would have been a great card. I mean, that would have been interesting because they brought so much emotion to these, these other cards, you know? Um, like a card of Mike Milbury throwing a chair on the ice. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great. Milbs, yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he's always a character. But I mean, I'm looking at, like, uh, you know, they had like they had a few cards of the heroes of hockey. Um, That's it... what I was thinking of, the heroes of hockey. Right. Was, the, was, was that in the updates? That high series. Uh, yes, it was. So there. Uh, so what's interesting about this, and 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 talk about like good timing or, or quick timing. So the World Junior Championship happens like December, January, and the All Star Game happened in Chicago. I went to it that year, um, like mid January. And then this set came out, like, February or March. Like, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact date, but it was before the season ended. And so they had all the World Junior Canadian players. They had some of the heroes of hockey. Um, They had some of the traded guys. They had pictures from the All-Star game that happened, like, maybe five, six weeks before. So, I mean, um, it was was pretty cool. I mean, they they were... um, they weren't just like, oh, okay, well, this guy was traded, and yeah, I mean, of course, they got like Chelios and Savard and Horachuk and, and everyone else in their new jerseys, but they also got some cards of things that had happened considerably recent to the release date, so they really pushed it uh, as far as how uh, how quick they were turning these around. The other big thing about this, uh, you can't forget, was the rookies. Oh, yeah. The rookie class in this set was unmatched, I think. Yeah. Yep. You consider all of the rookie cards of the Hall of Famers and, I guess, future Hall of Famers since there's still at least one that's playing. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but um, you know, 
there were so many rookies in this set. And guys that you wouldn't have normally thought would have been, you know, how you think of eligibility for being put on a card nowadays. You know, these were guys that hadn't played an NHL game yet. You know, guys like Scott Niedermayer and, and uh, Felix Potman, who had World Junior Championship cards in there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they hadn't they hadn't yet played an NHL game. Right. Yeah, and I mean, that was, that was kind of exciting. Um, I think I was more interested in, like, to me, like, if you look at, like, the Canadian World Junior set, okay, that's kind of nice. But, like, you know, some of those guys didn't really make it to the NHL. But then I guess a lot of the guys in the set, well, actually, you know, when I did my write-up about all the different 9091 sets, and it looks like they're, according to HockeyDB, there's 186 rookie cards in this set, although I would argue that the card of Zamboni creator, Frank Zamboni, should count as a rookie card, so maybe we could say 500, or excuse me, 187 rookie cards in the set. Um, and there were a lot of good ones. There are a couple, only three duds that come to mind, um, and I'm pulling this up here. Jason Herter, Jason Souls, and Jason Miller, uh, which I guess just bad Jasons, right? Uh, I was going to say, is the name Jason Kirst then? Uh, at least in Upper Deck. I don't think Jason Souls played any games. Jason Herter played five years, like, after his rookie card came out. What was interesting about that was, like, he was drafted, he's shown as a Canuck, but he didn't have a... It, I, I'm going to try to not botch this story, but uh, and I've written about it on Puck Junk, but, like, he was still under... He was still a college player, but he got paid to be in the Upper Deck set, because if they take your picture and they put you in a trading card set, they pay you, right? Well, he was still a college player, and college players aren't supposed to get money for their hockey. Crazy. I know. Yeah, it sounds it sounds ridiculous. I mean, it's it, it it's totally ridiculous. And um, I mean, we could talk about that all day too. But like, um, so it was a little controversial that he was in that set. And then, of course, the way they just kind of shoehorned Eric Lindros into that set uh was also controversial if you remember that oh yeah because he had an exclusive deal with score at the time so you know upper deck was able to sneak him onto that card it's like a multiplayer card canada's canada's captains no they're holding up like the the trophy for the world junior championship it's like the trophy or the plate or whatever they get it's a plate yeah Yeah. it's a decorative plate limited strictly limited to 500 firing days um sorry kidding Bad joke. Was he, uh, I got you. They're calling out while Call. supplies last. Right. Uh, was he on another card, too, in that set? He was not on another card that I that I know of. He was on this, uh, no, but Upper Deck, like, the next year, they put him in the Canada Cup subset. And they're like, well, we're showing him as a Canada Cup player. Oh, yeah, he was a Canada Cup player in there, and I think he had a he had a couple others in that set too, didn't he? In the ninety one, ninety two. I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's the only one. Uh, I know See, I was thinking, Score made like a ton of cards of him because yeah. he was their golden boy. I was thinking for some reason I remember him being somewhere on another card in ninety nine one. Maybe he was in the background of somebody's card. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know, but yeah, that was that was the interesting thing because everybody wanted that card because. Was the forbidden card. He wasn't supposed to be on it. Yeah. It was kind of funny how Upper Deck kind of just did whatever the hell they wanted um, as far as Lindros goes. Like, well, we're just going to... Because every year they found a way to include him in the set, whether it was, like, superimposing his head on somebody else's body like they did in their 92-93 set or including him with the Canada Cup subset in 91-92 or the World Junior Championship in 1991, so they just did whatever the F they wanted and, 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 and were fine with that. And I guess, I don't want to say you can't blame them, because Upper Deck has done some less than noble things over the years as a company, but, um, you know, the most popular prospect, you're going to want to have them in the set, and you're going to find a way to do it. So they get an A for creativity. Less than noble. Whatever could you be referring to? Oh, I don't know, reprinting the promo cards, the Gretzky and Wah promo cards that they gave uh, out at the National in 1990. The good old prototypes that show up everywhere without the easement. Without yeah. the what? 
without the encasement. Right. And uh, so what I want to say about that real quick, and again, I also have an article about this on Puck Junk. If it's in the encasement or if it's not in the encasement, it's still the same cards. So if you like the cards, buy the cards. Don't don't we're we're done worrying about value. We've put that argument to rest 20 something years ago. But if you are like me and you want I didn't say, "Oh, I really wanted to have the ones that came from the National versus the ones that they've reprinted 6 months later." What I wanted to do was I just wanted to have the case that it came in because I'm a completist. I like that sort of stuff. I mean, I have like upper deck posters. I have like an upper deck promo poster from 1991 that basically has the box art and then it has Gretzky in front of it. And I mean, one of these days I'm going to like frame it and put it up. I mean, I love that sort of stuff, that sort of historical stuff. But yeah, I mean, they did they did reprint those cards. They, you know... 20 years later, they reprinted Yu-Gi-Oh cards. They, uh, you know, that's what I was thinking of the reprint on the Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Cause that was a, that was a major issue. Well, that tips the balance as far as like the competitive CCG goes, right? If you could just go to Walmart and buy a repack and you go, Oh, there's that. I don't know the first thing about Yu-Gi-Oh. There's Yu-Gi-Oh. And it's the special purple diamond variant of Yu-Gi-Oh. And, and this one is going to, I'm going to put this in my deck and I'm going to be invincible. Right. And then everybody buys that same purple diamond Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, for $10 and then everybody has it in their deck and then it, devalues the card and it just yeah i mean that's it's not not the greatest thing to do no not not, not at all so but anyway i digress is there such thing as a purple Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> i don't what? know do i look or sound like i know what Yu-Gi-Oh even is you have kids so you gotta know this stuff okay i do Slim amounts of Pokemon stuff. Yep. But Yu Gi Oh is well beyond anything I can grasp my feeble mind around. Well, good, good for you. You know, I mean, keep it real, right? I mean, Pokemon was the be all end all as far as I'm concerned when it comes to uh, monsters and card games. Um, I, have a bo- I have a box sitting on the shelf behind me over here that's full of magic cards. I couldn't tell you the first thing about them. Yeah, I know my girlfriend sold all her magic cards when they were still uh, popular, like be- well before we met. I mean, she was like, all right, screw this, I'm getting out, and she sold it while the, the getting was good. kind of wish I did that with some of my hockey cards, but whatever. Yeah, especially the 9091 Upper Deck, because we were all going to retire off of these. Right, and oh, uh, you know, we can't really talk about 9091 Upper Deck without talking about... Come on, you know what I'm going to say. Uh, I don't know, what are you going to say? Well, okay, so uh, some of the upper deck cards were printed with English text on the back. Oh, yes. And some of it were the oh, the, the French cards. The French version of upper deck. The, I, don't, I don't know what that even was. I mean, would you call, would you call that a gimmick? Or was that just trying to capture some type of market share from French speaking provinces. I don't know. I don't, I I mean, I get the Canada thing, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I mean, well, okay. So just to, just to backpedal a little bit. So in Canada, everybody thought they were rare though, right? I mean, that was the big thing. Everybody thought they were rare and they weren't. Right, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and if if you folks want to learn, like, everything I know about this, um, there's a great book, it's out of print, but you can find it on Amazon for about five, six bucks, it's called Card Sharks, and it talks about the history of the trading card industry, but also Upper Deck, so it also talks about, like, um, the tobacco industry, because the tobacco industry drove the trading card industry in the late 1800s, and it talks about, like, tops and Fleer, and, like, the Baseball Players Association and, and them lobbying to get their image rights and then stuff with hockey and the French cards. Uh, it, it's a fantastic book. But what uh, what the deal was with the French cards? Okay, so anything that's sold in Canada, it has to, from what I understand, the packaging, minimally the packaging has to be, in, it has to be bilingual. English and French for the people in Quebec. Now, the people in Quebec speak everyone i've met from quebec speaks beautiful english um 
and I'm not just saying that. I mean that. I mean they they learn to speak English, and the um, people outside of Quebec don't really learn to speak French. They kind of study it in high school for two years because they had to. That's what one of my friends in college told me, um, for what it's worth. So, like, with uh, Upper Deck French, what they did was they're like, all right, we're going to make these cards, and all the text is going to be in French, and these will be sold exclusively in the province of Quebec. Well, they weren't, Quebec didn't really care from what I remember. Like, the the hockey card collectors were just going to collect what was there. Like, if they got the English cards, fine. They didn't necessarily, like, buy up all the French cards. So what, they, what Upper Deck did was they started selling it to the dealers in the U.S. and Canada outside of Quebec, and they said, well, this is only limited to a tenth of the production run or a fifteenth of the production run because if we're only going to sell this to Quebec we don't need to make as many as if we're selling to everyone in the U.S. So then everybody lost their shit over this saying oh my god this card is way rarer. I remember seeing a Jeremy Roenick rookie card in the case had a fifteen dollar tag on it and I looked and I smiled and I said to the dealer you know me being fifteen or whatever I said oh I have that card I didn't know it was worth $15 worth, right? And he looked at me and he said, oh, well, that's the French version of the card. And I was like, what? Like, right? And so then that's when I became enlightened. Like, oh, so there's a version of this card that is a tenth of the production run as the other ones. And so therefore it's worth 10 times more. But I think... The biggest problem with the French cards is that uh, nobody who bought them could actually read them. There was there was a there was a hobby shop in the town that I lived in at the time. Yep, that had plentiful supply of 1991 Upper Deck. That's where I got the majority of what I got from. But they had the French version in there, and I remember he had two boxes of it. He had one on the counter selling packs unsealed that you could buy and the packs themselves were $25 each wow 25 bucks a piece because they were so rare right so when it really got crazy was when upper deck went to the high number series so recall um so the cards one through 400 were sold in packs but then cards 401 through 550 you could either buy a factory set which was nice, or you could buy packs that said high numbers on them, and then they would have like three or four, <coughs> you know, I'm trying to remember, they'd have like three or four of the high number cards per pack. So you were basically buy if you already completed your set, you were basically buying more of the same cards. Actually, I got a wrapper right here. Right, and it's the high numbers were all high numbers. Beg pardon? I said because the high number packs were not all high numbers. Correct. They had an assortment of cards, including uh, low saw... low numbers and high numbers. So yeah. you would buy this, and you might get nine cards that were from one through four hundred, and then you'd get like three cards that were like f- somewhere between four hundred one and and five fifty, right? So then all of a sudden, everybody was like, "Well, who's in four hundred one through five fifty? Who was the big name in that in that span?" Fedorov. Fedorov. Yeah, so everybody was like, oh, the Sergei Fedorov Young Gun is a $25 card if it's the French version, right? So what had happened... Burray's Burray's only rookie card is in there, too. Burray's rookie card. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few in there in in, in the high uh, numbers. But um, so what happens then is that uh, people... uh, you know, saw value in that, and Upper Deck realized that, and they actually, um, they actually reprinted their high number French packs. And again, that's talked about in Card Sharks. And one of the the tells for that was that if you bought a um, pack of Upper Deck French high number cards. There might be three of the high number cards and the other nine were like the low numbers. But if you bought one of the packs that were done later on, there were something like, I want to say like four or maybe even six um, of the high series per pack. 
So basically what they were doing is they were putting, you know, so that you had a higher chance of getting a Sergei Fedorov card in that and it'd be more desirable. Um, but they kind of goofed there. And so um, that was, uh, you know, uh, again, one of those like less than um, noble things that they did. But then at the same time, I mean, look, if you're a card company and people are buying what you're selling, sell it. Sell it. I mean, Opeachy did the same thing in 8990 when they just when they went back to the presses and then they shit out a bunch of uh, 8990 Opeachy. I mean, there was so much of that stuff. I remember in the summer, every card shop I went to had 8990 Opeachy for 50 cents a pack. They couldn't get rid of it. They had so much of it. I mean, you bought an 8990 Opeachy set for $3 at a national a couple years ago. I said, Tim, you got to buy the set. It's 3 bucks, right? So, I mean, if you're a card company and you print it and people buy it by all means there's nothing wrong with that just you know buyer beware well and that's exactly it i mean it's one thing it's one thing to sell your product and sell your product and when you run out make more and sell more of your product right obviously supply and demand but at the same time you know don't produce your cards and then try to pass it off as something that it's not Right. That's where they. That's where they. The, the big issue was, you know, them saying that, oh, these are much, much more rare, when in actuality, they were no more rare than the regular ones. Right. Do you? Uh, do you? Do you? Did you put this set together as a kid? Um, I wasn't a set collector back then. Oh, okay. I, you... you know, I I had some stuff. I collected star players. I put them in binders and used those to trade and. I really didn't really didn't build sets that much back then. I think the first the first set I actually put together, and it was only because I realized I had so many, was the eighty nine ninety top set. Mm. Okay. I just had tons of dupes, so day, and I was missing three out of the whole set, and I ended up trading for those, and that was it. Was that when was that? Uh, probably about. Well, Okay, so pretty pretty close to when it came out. Yeah, this this was a set that I, I remember putting together, um, buying tons of cards, uh, trading with other people. I think the last card I needed, I'm looking at it right here. I want to say, I want to say it was, I want to say it was Mario Merwa on the Nordiques, which was on the front page if you put them in pages. And I think what had happened was I think I had accidentally put another card in that spot and then I thought my set was complete and then I'm going through it and then I realized I had two of the same card and I was just like, ah, son of a gun, I need to, now I need to track down this Nordique player, right? Like it was just like so annoying because it was so annoying to get cards back then. It's so annoying. I mean, like the one that you need or the two that you need or the 15 that you need. And now it's just, you know, if you, got the money. I mean, if you don't mind paying $3 for shipping, you can pretty much have anything. That's true. That is true. The only card that I remember, like, trying to hoard was the Yager Rookie. The draft pick card. That was a good card. Um, I remember... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Back then... I think I had 12 of them. Wow. And that was that was a lot of them back then. I mean, cards were 6 7 bucks Easily. Yeah, I remember in Chicago, it was like a solid $5 card. I remember walking into a comic book store, and they had it priced at a buck and a quarter, and I bought it, and I was just like, yes, because it was like a $5, <laughs> again, deprecating quotes around $5. It was a $5 card back then. Now it's a card I find in a quarter box, and I usually feel sorry for it, and I say, oh, Yager Rookie used to be a $5 card. Now you're in the quarter box. So then I rescue it. I put it in a penny sleeve. I put it in a top loader that says rookie card. And I put it with a bunch of my other rookie cards. And it's there. And I probably have five or ten of them. I do the same with the Ronick rookies. Actually, you know what was funny is even as a grown man, when I find a Ronick rookie, especially an upper deck one, in a rummage box... I'll be like, yay, ah, like, I'll be like, yeah, like, I found something, but then I realize that it's not what it was, right? Like, it's, it's worthless right. now. So right. I still buy it, put it in a, in a sleeve and a top loader. I have something ridiculous, like 1,400 Jeremy Roenick rookie cards um, of varying brands, not just Upper Deck. But this was the, this was the set that started all of that. 
I mean, really, you got you got to think about that. I don't think anybody would have been hoarding, you know, pro set cards. They did though. Going after going after those. I'm talking now. You can fast forward to now. Most people see pro set cards now and they laugh because right. they're all colorful and look like bubble gum. But you know, the ninety ninety one upper deck people still see those and they're like. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, if they didn't think that was the case, Upper Deck wouldn't have resurrected that whole design a few years back when they put in all of those retro inserts. Right. They just redid the whole set over again, but with modern players. And if you're going to, I mean, I tell people, if you're going to collect hockey, you really need to have this set. I mean, it's dirt cheap, but uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of collectors, they try to have like full runs and like, especially like a newer collector, uh, if there are any... You know, obviously, p- people like my age, they don't want cards from the 80s. But if you're somebody who's like, no, I'm really good with cards from 2000s or cards with the 90s or even like the more modern cards, there's something cool about having all the upper deck sets from 9091 to, you know, this this current season. Because they're, you know, just for that continuity reason, just like it's cool to have all the OPT sets from 68, 69 to, um, well, I guess you could count 93, 94 in that, you know, to have that, that run right there. Right. I mean, for the completest, that's, that's the perfect thing to have. But for, for a newbie, for, you know, just starting out like, Hey, I want to collect hockey cards. This is the perfect set to start your collection with. Oh yeah. A lot of hall of famers. I mean, especially, uh, and a lot of superstars and yeah, one of them is still playing. Um, yeah, it's just nice to look at, uh, and then it's just kind of funny how, like, 25 years later, Upper Deck is still the last man standing. That's true. Well, Tim, any final thoughts on this set before uh, before we call it a podcast? Um, my final thought is... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Like What's that? The checklists. Oh, the checklist. Yeah. yeah, remember those? The, the nice the painting checklist. Some were better than others. Those were always cool. I liked them. So, you know, they reminded me of the, remember the 9091 Skybox basketball set that had, like, the computer-generated backgrounds? Yes. These reminded, okay, I wanted that to be made into a hockey set so bad. You have no idea. Like, I know sometimes I, 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 I uh, diss upper deck for going to old designs and, like, borrowing like from basketball with like noise boys and stuff like that and and yeah. and all these inserts that don't make sense for for hockey. I mean, why don't they just do like court kings or something, you know? But 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 put a hockey player on it, right? But like which would make no sense cuz you don't have a hockey court. But if they did that that skybox set, if they did that with hockey, I would absolutely love that. I mean, they kind of got into that, the, the companies where they would start superimposing players on, like, crazy-ass backgrounds, like, especially if you think of, like, Ice, or SP Authentic, or SPX, or stuff like that, they kind of do that, but there was just something so cool about those Skybox basketball cards, and these Upper Deck paintings reminded me of of those skybox cards, and 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 that's why I like them. Even though the likenesses weren't always the best, they were good enough, and they looked cool enough, and it was just really creative, especially for someone like me who liked to draw as a kid. Yeah, and you know, if they ever did bring that set back, obviously Upper Deck would be the ones to do it because I think Fleer, Fleer at one point got the skybox brand, and then now Upper Deck has the Fleer brand, so. They throw Skybox, the Skybox Impact as a subset into all of the showcase sets, so you never know. Who knows? That would be great with the with the computer generated imagery. But you know, even without that upper deck from uh, ninety ninety one was uh was awesome. You know it's funny, like even like one of my uh one of the guys I play hockey with, he he made a comment like he just uh he still remembers the Joel jo- the Joel auto card where he's blowing the bubble. The, oh, yeah. the bubble gum and blowing the bubble. And he just, yeah. like, he made, like, a comment about that. Like, he said, like, oh, if I had a hockey card, I'd want it to look like, uh, well, the guys on my team, yeah, you know how my team, we made hockey cards for my men's league team. And he jokingly said, I want my card to look like Gelato's card. You know, can we have me blowing a bubble uh, of uh, gum on it? Of course, that didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's funny that, like, a, someone who, like, probably threw away his cards 20 years ago because he's my age uh 
still remembers that card, and he's just he thinks it's awesome. I would I would want my card to be more like the Olaf Kolzig card, pinnacle card with the mustard on the hot dog. Oh yeah, that's but a good. Instead of instead of mustard on a hot dog, it would be beer. Oh yeah, just beer. Just beer. All right. Well, I think. Uh... I don't think that would be... Uh, I think they'd have to Photoshop it into something else. It'd be like a... It'd be like a... a um, it'd be like Green River Soda. It won't have a label on it, so they don't have to like, like pay anybody. It'll just be just a generic glass with beer. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, on that note, I think we've said everything we can about this set. If you don't own it, buy it. Uh, if you do own it, uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you think about... Uh, the 9091 Upper Deck set because, uh, you know, I'd love to continue this conversation. I could talk about this uh, neo-vintage stuff forever. If you need singles, come to me because I've got boxes of them. <laughs> Two for a nickel. <laughs>